Hi, Matt here. One, two, three blocks are the stable of every machinist for setting up jobs. The most important feature about the blocks is that each block has the same dimensions and that the sides of each block are parallel and square. The actual dimension of the block can vary as you need it, but the most common size is one inch by two inch by three inch. One use of the blocks is to offset your part from the table of your mill or vise so that you can machine all the way through your part. Holes can be added to allow for joining blocks together. To get started, measure the material you are starting off with. I'm using a digital caliper and you can see that my starting material is less than 1 inch and 2 inches. This means I will have to keep these blocks separate from my other blocks to ensure that I don't set up a part that may have some tilt in it from the blocks being a different dimension. Look out for damaged areas. Avoid them as best you can or you'll have to work harder to get the surface finish you want. This stock was purchased at 12 inches and will make at least three blocks. Mark and cut off your first block. Make sure the mark gives you extra material to work with if the cut isn't very straight. I used my bandsaw to do the cutting, but you could do the job by hand. Use a little cutting oil to help the blade make the cut. Using a machinist square to check the cut, we find that it was not very square. This is why we gave ourselves a little extra material to work with. Open your vise up and load your block in between the jaws. You can load the part the way I have it, but it's not the only choice you have for loading the block. I keep lots of oil on the vise to prevent rusting and I recommend you do the same. You have a choice in the tools you use, but the test indicator and universal mount are a must have. The end mill can be used for doing the facing. The part would be positioned on its side so the end mill can make a full cut with the flutes. A shell mill is good for facing and roughing out material and will be the one I use. The part can be positioned as it is and I will get very good rigidity while cutting. Lastly is the fly cutter. It does a great job on finishing cuts but is slow to remove material. Attach the universal indicator mount to the machine spindle. These tools come in a variety of mounts including a magnetic mount. In either case, the extra joints in the holder allow us to get the indicator in the correct position. Attach your indicator of choice and tighten the joints down snugly. When the indicator is in its final position, lock down the joints. Bring your part up to the indicator slowly. You don't want to crash and risk damaging anything. When the indicator touches the part, slow down to accurately position the needle on the zero mark. Move the z-axis up and down and watch the needle move. Tap the part as needed to get the needle back on zero. I should mention that zero is not mandatory and any number on the dial face will do. The goal is to get the needle to stay on the number as the z-axis moves. Then you will know the part is straight up and down. It's time to make your first cuts. Remove your indicator and load your tool of choice. Lock down your tool with the draw bar, or if you are using a collet holder, lock down your tool with the collet nut. I do not recommend holding end mill cutters in a drill chuck. Only drills should go in drill chucks unless you're desperate or it's not important. Set your machine to the settings needed. The shell mill has a large cutting diameter and this means more torque and lower RPMs is preferred, especially because this mill only has one horsepower. Position your block under the cutter, or if you have the block in a different position than me, you might position the block off to one side. Bring the cutter into the material slowly. You want to look and listen for the cut to start, then zero your dials, or in my case, a DRO. This is called touching off and is a common practice for quickly setting the start position. If the workpiece has less material to work with or the accuracy is much higher, then other zeroing techniques should be used, such as a tool height setter. 
The first side here needs to be cut till the marks from our saw cut have been removed. Then stop cutting and remove the part for an inspection. This is called IPQA or in process quality assurance and is common practice in job shops and manufacturing as a whole. We still need to finish cutting the last side. The important features are that the sides be parallel and square and then we check to make sure that we have enough material left to finish the block. Using a surface plate or the mill table as a reference, we check the size with the machine square. Then check the length to see how far we still have to go, unless we've cut too far already. Using the calipers, we find that we have another 40 thousandths to go. Clean up the jaws to prevent debris from tipping the part. We reload the part and set up the same way we did earlier. It's tedious work, but it's necessary to get good precision. We touch off the cutter and this time it's very important to keep track of how much material we remove. We are trying to get this dimension to be as close to 3 inches as we can. I'll leave about 5 thousandths for finishing. I stop to take one last measurement with the calipers to confirm the amount I have left to remove. Then we make our finishing cut. It's time to do the fine finishing. The block sides may be the right dimension, but oftentimes are wavy and cause fluctuations across the surface of that side. The sides need to be as flat as we can get them for reliably positioning our work. This is oftentimes done with a surface grinder, but I don't have one. So sandpaper on the surface plate is my next option. The surface plate sets the flatness of the sandpaper, and the sandpaper is held in place with double-sided tape. A small amount of clean water is used to clear the grinding dust. From here on, it's very critical that I provide even pressure on the block and make full use of the sandpaper. I don't want to make the sides uneven in any way. Depending on how rough your material is, start off with sandpaper that will quickly remove the roughness. Then move up to at least 220 grit. Here you see me using 800 grit. You can still see a bit of pitting in the surface from the raw material. This should not be a problem as it's likely to be a very small amount of pitting at this point. To see how well we did, we will check the sides of the part by running a dial indicator across the surface. The dial indicator is held by a magnetic holder and attached to a height gauge. We set the indicator to zero and move slowly and gently across all the block's edges. Our part is within one and a half thousandths on all sides, which is very good. Make a few more to complete a set and keep these wrapped in paper that has been soaked in oil to prevent rusting. Be aware that some steels are very soft. The steel I used is 1018. Dinging and scratching is bound to happen to this material over time. If you want to reduce this, buy a heat treatable grade steel and get your block heat treated.
If you like this video, then here's a video on how to build your own track car. Also, we are building our own supercar and a video is right here for that. Check out our website for more info about the car. The link is in the description. We have lots of videos coming in the near future. To make sure you don't miss an episode, be sure to subscribe. If you like our work and want to help us continue making this content, you can make a donation through YouTube or on our website. Till next time, thanks for watching.